To be mechanical is to be uh, done as if by machine, seemingly uninfluenced by the mind or the emotions. When we talk about somebody being too mechanically oriented, we say that they're looking for a cookbook. In other words, I want a technique where I don't have to think. All I have to do is just do. So this is why I think that we should recognize the, the good of mechanics and the bad of mechanics. But the problem is, when you become too mechanical in your orientation, you look at almost a military discipline. Two, three, four. You get to this stage and you turn. Two, three, four. Turn the other way. Two, three. That's what you're looking for when you become mechanically oriented because there is no mind working. This is the reason why I don't focus on mechanics as a technique. In other words, you're fitting the patient to your technique. This is my technique, so this is the way I have to treat my patient in order to get them molded into my technique. Now, do you know anything about bioprogressive technique? Can you say there's a one, two, three things that we do in bioprogressive? Evans, no. Yeah, bioprogressive is a wedding of progression with biology. The application of biomechanical principles in a sequence with a predetermined hierarchy in order to produce the maximum benefit with minimum of effort. And, of course, with the least amount of tissue damage. So, over a period of 40 years, we tried to apply all the best features of all the techniques we knew about and employ their principles in what we now call the bioprogressive philosophy. It's the interaction of the body of principles with an integration of physical and biologic laws. So we put a bracket on so we can control the movement of the tooth. We may want to put it on to use that tooth as an anchor to move a tooth at some other place in the mouth. Now the last reason is to protect the tooth itself from abrasion, erosion, or caries. I had one girl one time that I took her appliances off after I treated her. I could see a ridge on the tooth where the band was. Everywhere she had a band covering her tooth, there was a ridge. Why? She was a lemon sucker. Have you ever seen a bilemic? There is a certain disease that's uh, sometimes associated with anorexia. Some people get the uh, impression that they're too fat and they look in the mirror and see any tissue that's not muscle, they think they're too fat. And it's a terrible disease. The bilemic person, every time they eat a meal, they will go and vomit it out. They will also erode their teeth. I've seen two bilemics. And I've had several people who were uh, citrus eaters. Bands for those people are good. <laughs> There's three orders of movement. Steps of the central axis are first orders. Change in the direction of the central axis of the wire. And the third order is torsion. Now we're really are pretty much limited to the five aspects of mechanical advantage. In physics, these are the lever, the inclined plane, the screw, the spring, and the pulley. But these are all the known methods, maybe in including some hydraulics. We have five primary actions. Leveling, rotation, angulation, torquing, and in and out bends. So, all of these are involved in the design of a bracket or a tube or an auxiliary. Now what we did then was to establish 70 principles. It starts with the fixed apparatus. It's applied in sequence so it should be preformed and prefabbed and pre-adjusted. The fourth dimension means time. 
the fourth dimension also includes a therapeutic ideal to uh, give protection for the relapse. Don't forget also that you don't have to put a fixed appliance on everybody. There's, there's an application for these that's perfectly acceptable in the right place with the right patient. But we also want an appliance that will be highly versatile so we can adapt it to about any kind of a condition. We want to make it progressional and we want to have it biologically suited to our needs. But based on the evidence that I have, there's a difference in how far the condyle goes back in the forecast and it's based on the distance that the porion and the joint is from the PTV to start with. The prediction is first made just by extending CCN then move the condyle back the amount the porion moves. Now the average is five tenths of a millimeter a year. Now, if that distance is long to begin with, to the age and sex and size of the patient, these are the biologic corrections we have to make. Now, if that is that way, then if it's an average distance, we give an average amount per year of five tenths. Now, in the oriental skull, you're dealing with something that's like my hands here. I mentioned to you that in the submental vertex, the great wing of the sphenoid forms a sort of a line as it comes up out of the body of the sphenoid. That the petrous portion of the temporal bone is in direct line with that. This is very visible, particularly when you take an x-ray. Now, if you can imagine that this is a skull. In the ordinary Caucasian Anglo-Saxon skull, these this, this cross is like so. It carries the glenoid fossa posterior, while this is carried anterior. Now in the oriental skull, see, he's brachiofacial and brachycephalic. Now in his face, as he grows, his cranial base would look like so. Now, in him, the crossing is like so. Now as he grows, this is growing out toward the x-ray tube. So this distance is less. It would be shorter when you start. So when this is short, we think that we have to give less growth to it. If we put a force on the very first tissue to pick it up is the fluid within the socket and the interstitial fluid because that is a connected tissue. So that little bit of pressure is great enough to produce a neurotransmitter to start and initiate sending signals into the system. If that is intermittent like chewing, then it has no consequence except to maintain the equilibrium in the, in the area. But nature is going to try to adjust things if it's continuous in order to reach a new state of equilibrium or restore the former equilibrium. Now the second tissue to pick it up is the pull of the periodontal membrane on the tension side. The, on the compression side, the, uh, the ligament is relaxed. What is not well known is that the ligament stretches and particularly the type of collagen that's found in the periodontal ligament has quite a bit of stretch in it. It has to be that way for chewing and for the conditions that we see in the oral cavity. It was shown by Story and his students some years ago that within eight minutes the periodontal membrane is fully stretched on the tension side and the tooth was up against the bone through the compressed membrane on the pressure side. This means then, as far as the ligament for anchorage is concerned, it's only worth eight minutes. And the next line of resistance, therefore, is the bony socket. 
Now, histologist tells us that bone resorption is the faster process when uh, the bone apposition is compared to it. This would seem to suggest, therefore, that if a tooth is moved and resorption is the faster of the two processes, uh, then it would be the pull of the periodontal membrane that would be the anchor. In fact, is Brody tried to make a case of this when it was determined that resorption was the faster of the two processes. What they failed to realize, however, that the interstitial fluids are, are uh, uh, squeezed out and that uh, bone then can't resorb that fast. So it becomes back again that bone in resorption around the socket under treatment is the slower of the two processes. Now the next thing is that if the pressure is moderate or light, uh, the area will try to maintain itself and resorption will take place on a frontal type of an attack, a frontal surface area. It's like in a battle. You can have a wave come in like you did in World War I and two armies would meet. And uh, this is a frontal attack. When you have light to moderate force, this uh, frontal attack, these little soldiers, these little osteoclasts and macrophages will chew away and make a space for the tooth to move in. And new bone will form behind the membrane. And the membrane then will adjust on the tension side. So you can see in the x-ray an area of immature bone. Remember there's immature, mature, and senile bone. New bone is immature, particularly if it's laid down very fast. It will then reorganize and become mature bone, a thin lamina dura. And this is the way we uh, conceive that the tooth is moving all the time. But now if we exceed a certain level that's normal for that tissue, we come to a temporary standstill because the armies clash and nobody's winning. So uh, the forces now try to encircle. So there's flanking action that starts. Action will start deep in the bone. An osteoclast will form as a result of the exceedingly great pressure. And you have rear action starting. It's coming from the cancellous bone and coming against the lamina dura from the opposite side. Now once that uh, uh, is present and the force is still there, then the tooth will move very rapidly into that space created. And this is another way of doing orthodontics. So heavy forces can use, but it's a different process. And of course, that excessive pressure is going to create some bone loss. And you're dealing with pathology and repair rather than a normal physiologic process. Now, that's fine as long as we're dealing with movement of teeth within the alveolar process. But the problem in orthodontics is that we have cortical bone on the inner and outer plates. So there's soft bone in the middle, but on the outside you have compact bone. But cortical bone in certain places, particularly in the mandible, can be as much as six, seven, and eight millimeters thick. In addition to that, there is no cancellous area where rear action can take place. So the problem now is that when the tooth gets away from the cancellous bone or out of the trough. We call between the plates the trough. When we build a house and we want the water not to run straight off of the roof, but we want to gather the water and direct it to a certain place, then there is a water trough. Uh, when you feed chickens and put the seeds or the grain into a little container, this is called a trough. Move them, ac uh, move them efficiently and move them, move them with the least resistance. We want to keep them in the trough. In other words, we want to avoid the cortical plates. This is another reason why I like to use section mechanics 
rather than sliding mechanics. You want to control the root to keep it from hanging up. Because when you hit the cortical bone, that becomes the anchor. Another reason for our seven degree <laughs> torque on our canine brackets <laughs> to keep the tooth in the, between the cortical plate. <laughs> If we don't do that, <laughs> we're either going to lose anchorage or have to reinforce anchorage. <laughs> Now let me see if I can give you an example of uh, the presence of cortical bone on clinical situations. Probably the number one site that it's easy to recognize is on the planum alveolar of the lower incisors. Back in the old days, we used to retract the cuspids and then thought we could upright the lower incisors very rapidly. So we would uh, start tiebacks. Now what had happened, the crowns would start to come back. But then the roots would start to go forward. Why would the, why would the, the roots go forward? Because the cancellous bone would undergo change and the outer plate is very thin but the lingual plate is thick, tough and it resorbs very slowly because the root is tapered anyway. Now we get the tooth in this place and we put more force on it. Now what happens? It slides up the plate. So it used to be said that extraction cases always closed the bite. The people thought that the mandible was rotating closed because the bite was closing. What happened was that they were extruding the tooth because they were moving it with such power. They were sclerosing a part of the area and the bone couldn't change fast enough. So the lingual plate in a retraction of incisors is one example of cortical anchorage. Now of even greater noticeability is uh, the extraction in uh, particularly older patients in class 2 division 1 or division 2 where the palatal plate is present. Not only did we have trouble resorbing this plate with the so-called rabbiting of the incisors, like a rabbit's tooth. But we would extrude it also. And now attempting then to torque in a second stage. This is particularly true of the, of the bag philosophy. Now I warned about this many years ago. If the bone isn't resorbing fast, then maybe the root will melt. The root may melt. It really does. It just melts away. So they ended up with a half a root on the upper incisors. This is the reason why I try to stay with a 16 square blue algaloy wire practically all the way through treatment. There's a tendency to put on bigger wires. Heavier force. And they're not thinking about the bone and thinking about tissue. And they're just only thinking about mechanically doing it. Now another place is in an extraction case in the planum alveolar around on the side. A lot of times as the canine has come in in a crowded condition and it's forward, you take the bicuspid out and you start to retract the canine. Now, Say this is the canine and this is the bone. The bone is, the canine's out here, but the bone is laying in a curve. And I start bringing the canine back here like so. With too much force, the root starts to come up this way. The crown will come up here. And the root will go later. Now I get the tooth in this position. Now I got a resorbed bone on the inside and then cortical plate on the outside. Can you imagine it? So the idea then is to leave the tooth here, even let the crown go further buccally. And I use the word treat with grace. Understand what all of the tissues are. And I take the tooth around this way, keep the root inside here away from the buccal plate. 
and you will not burn up the anchorage that we have in the past. Mm -hmm. So in extraction cases, even in adults, right. I won't even bracket the second bicuspid. Right. I bypass it for a number of reasons. I will go to the first molar or preferably the second molar. And I will try to control that root from this tooth way back here. So I want to keep the torque buckly, which is going to keep a lingual torque on my anchor tooth. So I'm keeping this tooth now anchored against the buccal plate and I'm controlling the movement of the root with my section. Let me give you a discussion here now of what I mean by transformal anchorage. All right. This is transformal anchor. Uh, I'm using anchor. I've trans transferred the anchorage away from the proximal tooth. Now contrast that to a straight wire. If I have a wire running between each one of the teeth, then the only thing that is going to affect the canine is the, is the premolar in back and the lateral in front. In other words, the proximal teeth. So as I keep leveling off, the only thing that can act is the two adjacent teeth. If the canine is elevated into the deep bite and tip distally, then when that wire goes in, the wire will be thrown anteriorly, superiorly. They say, I'm going to intrude the lower incisor. So you take the wire and put it like this. But when you put it in, all of that is taken up with the cuspid. So the first action when you put that in is to further extrude the lower incisor which is already in deep bite. I mean, where's our brains? You know? And we did that and did it and did it and did it and I saw that being done. And so when I first started into bioprogressive therapy, the first thing I did was to only band the canines and the molars. So the first job was to intrude the canine. So that's where I started in the lower arches. That's where I originally invented the word progressive, to progressively band up the mouth and to progressively unlock the contact points by moving the lower molar distally and intruding the canine with the force of tip back on the molar would intrude the canine and tip the molar back and open up the space for bands on the bicuspids. Now once I got the canine down, I put a wire in. Now that's low, so my first action then is to intrude the incisor. That was, that was one of the first moves that I made. Now you will understand why the edgewise people said that you could not intrude teeth. They, they didn't see it happening. We simply weren't thinking. We simply weren't trying to understand cortical bone anchorage. Now another example around the canines is bringing in of an impaction, particularly an upper impaction that comes out high into the buckle. A lot of people, once they got a hold of the tooth, wanted to speed things up so they'd start pulling down on the tooth very hard, only to find that the other teeth were intruding. What they fail to realize is there's still some cortical bone there. And you sclerose a tooth behind cortical bone, and you've got stability. So what does Ricketts do? I do a lot of my own surgery for cuspid impactions. I've been doing them for years. And what I would do would take a bone burr, and a rongeur. And I would take the bone out in the path that I wanted the tooth to move. I'm going to have to resorb it anyway. It's going to be lost anyway. So why don't I just prepare, prepare a channel for it to move in? Now, let's go back to the back of the mouth. 
後ろの方どうでしょうか九州部の方 How many of you have seen an impacted second molar? 例えば九州部ではその例えば6 or a second molar in crossbite、えー、7番が埋伏していたりそこがクロスバイトになってして that has come in over rotated あるいはその and too far to the lingual、えー、番です and you start bringing that tooth up、so、I'm really going to bring that baby up you know? ちゃんとまああの直立させようと so you put in a heavy wire、えー、じゃあもうまずヘビーワイヤーで始めたりする。Try to bring it up. え、なんとかしてその持ってこようとしますが。Everything else goes in. え、そうする。It's because of that heavy buckle plate. え、です。Now the next thing then that we want because I'm talking now not only about the hierarchy of resistance, but I'm talking about cortical anchorage. There was an old saying that an undisturbed tooth is the best anchor. え、ですか。So once in a while you'll get an adult case. With a second molar is beautifully anchored in bone. Take that case and put a Wilson lingual on it. It was an adult case that I treated without extraction and without mandibular surgery, but only with a genioplasty. It was one of these high convexity open bite cases. Now, with her, I started her with only the two lower second molars as anchors. And keep the teeth out here. Don't let them come up this way. If I put a round wire on to level, And I tie rotation. Each rotation I tie straightens wire out. And if I have a round wire in there, it's going to start rolling that molar upright. And that molar that's in a beautiful anchor position is going to come up here. And now there's no resistance to a vertical drag with the pull of elastic or space closing. With a tie back, the molar has no resistance. Eh, so the tie back the space will close to close. Once it starts, the bone in there, there's not much anchorage to it. We'll pass this around. And what I did was to take a mandible, cut it in half, then I made sections all the way down through. And I will ask you then to. Very carefully, look here at all of these different sections. Look how much bone there is buckle to the second and third molars. Now, where is the bone in the upper? Where is the heavy bone on the upper? I already talked about the palate. So there's heavy bone around the palate, particularly around the mesial or the lingual root of the upper molar. Is in this tough. A gnarled, fibrous type bone that's in the palate. The next heavy bone is in the key ridge. So the key ridge is a tough, heavy bone also. This explains why, with the quad helix, with bands only on the first molars, you can split a palate. If you keep these teeth upright before you put it in, bend them so that there's a force to take the roots out before if you want to split a palate with a quad helix don't just think in terms of moving the crown think of in terms of moving the roots so there's some tricks to putting in a quad helix so there is uh, an art to a headgear there's an art to a quad helix there's an art to retraction sections There's an art to the use of a utility. All of these appliances are powerful, powerful tools, and they all appear to be simple on the outside. But what you really have to understand now is the bone, where you want to move the teeth, how they're going to behave. I mean, that it's you can do so much with so little.